very much. Good morning to everyone. My name is uh, Sebastian Meragamba. I'm with the Internet Society and I'm glad to be here to moderate this uh, open forum. We have uh, three speakers today, and on my left, Yari Arco, who is the chairman of the IETF, then it's Peter Ernick, he's the Italian technical for application, and um, Andrew Sullivan, as a representative of a member of the Internet Architecture of the IAP. So, we're going to start with the presentations now, and we are going to make a report and then we got some questions and comments. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Don't have too many people, but that's, that's intense discussions. And, and um, I mean, we're not going to go to the basic, I think. I, I know most of you, and um, you know much of this anyway, so we'll just need you. And we were going to do that anyway, so it's a teaser of things. For discussion, discussion. And um, so I just wanted to start off with um, a couple of slides on why are we all here. So about the improvement, but um, I guess the main thing is that we, we want to enable the here. innovation is possible. And that is all the wonderful things that we have today, and not just those, but also. Wonderful things that we'll have in the future that we know yet about. And uh, so sort of the idea is that it's easy to create innovation, easy to create new things. You don't have to ask permission from you know your government or your mother or or your provider on creating something new. Whether whether the new thing is a web page or uh, a form or create new applications, uh, create something. Else. Good enough, maybe there's a billion users um, in a couple of months or a couple of years down the road. So, so that's the main thing, enabling this, this communication. Here's the next slide. So, standardization that you can play, um, you are supposed to be brought in, not set a small set of people, a restricted um, set of participants owning the government or vendors or such. Various engineers building yes, governments and um, other people. And we, of course, operate on the principle of rough consensus and running code. Um, I we might be able to talk about that a little bit more later. I hear that you have these documents from, on that matter. So, people have been referring to the rough consensus documents by Pete. Um, and, um, this week, and, and it, 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 it's a very good document. I recommend you read it if you haven't, haven't read it, even if you will go to the ITF, it's uh, probably worthwhile reading it. And open, of course, and this, the, the reason for all this is that we want to enable this borderless communication, borderless e-commerce, borderless innovation. Um, next slide. And, and I'm just finishing here, um, basically being a taste of some of the things that we are working on. Um, at the moment, or who, topics that get a lot of attention today. I mean, there's obviously a lot of different things worked on by the ITF. There's only uh, the, uh, over 120 different working groups, but but some of the things that are hot topics today include pervasive monitoring. And by the way, we'll we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, a Andrew is going to cover that issue and sort of give you a little bit of sense of what what the technical community is thinking about that topic and how, how we feel, um, or what, what do we feel that we can do as a technical community for the rest of the world on, on that topic. And then there are a couple of things that we can do. Um, we also quite a lot of working on the web protocol stack, you know, maybe more, I mean, the, you know, the basics are old, but uh, in the last couple of years and this year and last year in particular, there's been a lot, quite a bit of work on, on the protocol stack. Maybe a revolution, but it's um, fairly significant change is coming down the line. So that's pretty interesting. Um, many things happening right now. The Internet of Things, quite a lot of work on that, and it's, it's relatively practical, making it possible to do the Internet 
or to, to connect new types of link layers, making it possible to use the web protocol stack again on on devices and not just human communications. We've been working on uh, putting real-time communications as the phone calls on your browser. That's a pretty interesting thing for uh, for the regulators as well. It sort of opens up the market. IPv6 still a, a big topic in our work, even if the basics are done. But we're trying to make it easier and easier for special types of operators to adopt it, as an example. And not just technical things, but we've also been interested in the idea to reach out further in the world um, in terms of geographically, you know, where we where we visit or where we have meetings and where our attendees come from and reaching out to new types of participants. Um, we used to not think we really need to talk so much with the regulators or the policy people. Now we're kind of realizing that, oh, the world has changed and some things now overlap and we actually need to talk more to each other. So with that, I, I think um, I'm not going to speak anymore. I'm going to get to the other presentations and, and the discussion. Um, and uh, that th those are the important things. And I also want to uh, make an observation that I, I'll be stepping in and out of the room because I also need to be in another session today, or actually two other sessions today, same time. Thanks, guys, for organizing this so nicely for me. Um, but um, I'm sure we have that intense discussion. So I'm going to hand it over to Pete. Uh, all right, so uh, I thought I would uh, uh, talk very briefly. Uh, you'll notice that um, in order to give people here at the IGF a flavor of what um, the ITF is like, I use the high quality and sophisticated um, visual design um, that we're so famous for at the ITF uh, for these slides. So um, uh, the, the idea was that w we could have a, a quick overview of what the IETF and, and the IEB and other such uh, organizations are as compared to the rest of the, the internet, um, you know, actors. Um, uh, but this is going to be perhaps somewhat uh, redundant for many of you in the room, <laughs> since uh, I don't think I'll be telling you anything you don't know. My apologies, therefore. So the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, is uh, is the thing that designs the protocols of the internet. That's where we develop them. And and the the, the important part uh, to remember is that is that the real overarching goal of the IETF is interoperation. It's not it's not standards, it's not conformance, it's not making sure that this is a uh, you know, free um, thing like royalty free or anything like that. The whole goal is just interoperation. That's the number one, number one thing. There are some other things that we worry about, but interoperation is our main thing. We do this through open development and rough consensus. So rough consensus is not consensus of everybody in the room. Um, I guess I don't need to tell anyone here that. But. Um, our common goal is to make the network better. So it's not to you know make the world better. It's not a policy forum. It's it's really about network protocols. And this leaves out a whole lot of the rest of the world. Um, and then there is a, this IESG, the Internet Engineering Steering Group, who are normally the leaders, except that you know in the ITF there are no kings. So uh, it's it's better to think of this as a management layer. Next, please. So the IEB is the Internet Architecture Board, and this is, you can think of this partly as the external affairs department for the IETF. That is, that's, that's the, the place where, um, uh, where the IETF talks to the rest of the world. So liaisons, for instance, to other organizations are appointed by the IAB. Uh, in principle also, although um, some would complain that in recent years, not so much in fact, but in principle, um, the IEB is also supposed to look after the architecture of systems, so how these things uh, hang together. And if you do you know, some, this or that thing to the internet, what does it do to, um, to the way the rest of the system works? Um, uh, an important difference between the IAB and the IETF is that the IAB speaks for itself. So when, when something comes out from the IAB, it's not a statement of the IETF or anything like that. It's not a pronouncement from the technical community. It's just a bunch of people saying something. These people have been selected and presumably have some credentials, uh, some of us fewer than others. Um, uh, but um, you know, you, you, you really should take IAB statements as a statement from the IAB and not from anybody else. Next, please. Um, so the, I, uh, the, the ITF is really about protocol and not about policy. And, and the reason I want to emphasize that in this environment is that it means that sometimes the ITF 
the protocols of the ITF build enable policies that perhaps nobody in the ITF actually would like to happen. But um, nevertheless, uh, it, it's supposed to be a policy neutral uh, environment. Um, and that policy therefore lives elsewhere and the ITF just enables it. Um, the ITF makes its protocol registration, so there are some other you know, organizations you hear about. You hear about IANA, you hear about ICANN, you hear about RIR, so I'm just going to say a couple of things about that. Um, the, the, the real thing that the IANA does for the IETF is it manages this um, protocol parameters registry. And so a, a large number of protocols have various little bits that are necessary and you need somebody who just keeps track of, oh, this is option number one, this is option number two. From the IETF's point of view, that's what IANA's for. Um, IANA does other things like, you know, the root zone and so on, but from our point of view, it's really just this protocol parameters registry. And you'll sometimes hear people uh, from, the, from the protocol community will say things like, oh, the IANA function. And what they're talking about is not everything that anybody has ever described as the IANA function. They're really just talking about this protocol parameters registry. Um, I've heard that several times this week, and it occurred to me that maybe people didn't know that distinction. This is just a bookkeeping function. Um, the IAB can provide observations about how others' decisions affect the network architecture. And this is something you sometimes hear. So the IAB will make statements about other people. That doesn't mean that the IAB is telling them what to do. They're not the boss of the internet. Um, but they will make from time to time a comment, you know, um, so and so is going to make this change and we think it, it hurts in this or that way. Uh, and then, you know, ICANN, uh, regional internet registries, all of those uh, players are actually managing resources on the internet. And that is none of our business. Um, that's some, you know, that's another function on the internet. And that has much more to do. There's, a, there's an interplay between sort of pure technical coordination and policy there that is not really, um, the, the, not really something that the IETF uh, takes a great deal of notice of. The IAB, of course, will take notice of those kinds of things, particularly when they have some kind of effect on the way the network is working. That was everything I had to say about, about these, uh, these players and how they interact with one another. Thank you. So, as Andrew said, I, I'm on the uh, steering group on the IASG, and rarely do they let me come out of my box and actually say anything because the IASG does speak for the consensus of the IETF. Um, I'm peeking my head over the wall today to give you some insight into how we interact with some of these external players, and in particular, um, governments, because that's become more of an issue of late. We are starting to interact as the IETF with governments and regulators because of the kinds of protocols we're producing. So as Andrew said, we provide the protocols, not the policy. Um, and, and we are just there to instantiate those policies through protocols by giving you those tools. So the governments and IETF must understand the different roles they're playing. Um, we're going to provide the tools, but not how they're used. What governments have to give to the IETF is those functional goals, not technical specifications of those policies. And this has become a matter of confusion very often because we speak different languages. Um, I, I've been pushing the point to many people this week that there are great strengths among the different stakeholders and we must take on the things that uh, each of the stakeholders uh, is strong at and leave to the other players the things that they're strong at. Um, we do see different parts of the same elephant. Um, a, a for governments, they think in terms of laws and regulations, and those have ap applicability to protocols, but they are much different aspects. For the IETF, we see those laws and regulations simply in terms of the technical requirements for any given protocol. Next slide. So with, with regard to regulators in particular, and I think this is what comes up more often, is we think of those regulations codifying a particular policy. And what we in the IETF need is for those policies to be translated into protocol elements. Quite often we can figure that out um, because we do have folks who are adept at moving between the two areas. We have 
engineers who interact with governments on a regular basis and have to do that translation. Quite often we need assistance. The, the unfortunate thing is sometimes policies look like protocols and we jump all over that and try to implement the policy instead of implementing the protocol and it, it's one of the things I'll talk about in a moment when I get to examples. Um, again, we have to understand each other's roles and bring the expertise to the table that we're good at. Next slide. So let me talk about the two instances that I'm a little familiar with. Uh, the first I'm a little familiar with, the second quite. Uh, the first one is our ECRIT working group, Emergency Contact Resolution with Internet Technologies. Uh, if you don't know about IETF uh, working group names, we always come up with acronyms that are somehow either pronounceable or cute. And um, so we end up with sometimes completely stupid names, but because the acronym sounds good, we like it. So this, this is one of those. Um, this is about emergency calling uh, for North American folks, the 911 system, for other folks, the 112 system, but calling using internet protocols, uh, either voice or other technologies over IP. So in this particular instance, we've been working reasonably well with Nina, uh, the, uh, oh Lord, um, that, does someone remember Nina? Uh, numbering Authority of North America? Yes, I, okay. Uh, um, and Etsy for input to these, but we, this working group is chartered so that it can deal with emergency calling in any jurisdiction. But what this um, says to me, and, and what I think is a good reminder, is that even if we work with particular regulators who have come and said we have this need, quite often we charter these groups to make sure that they address needs around the world. And so as other regulators wish to come in, we find that exceedingly helpful. So just because we're working with one set of folks doesn't mean we're excluding others. Um, in this particular group, this is one where the participants are very good at translating that policy into protocol. These are folks who've been working with Nina and Etsy for quite some time. They understand what those policies mean and can figure out what tools are required in order to instantiate them. The other example is one of my working groups, which is PAUSE, the Protocol to Access White Space Database. Again, one of our wonderful acronyms. Um, this is a working group ostensibly, you would think, to work on radio white space from the TV spectrum, except this was one of the big problems in chartering. We're only providing the tools for this. So radio white space is an IEEE and, and uh, uh, air regulator kind of area. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is providing the ability for these devices that are going to be using the white space to contact the regulator and say what frequencies are available over the internet. And so this is basically a database mm -hmm. access protocol. Um, the problem we've been having in this working group is actually the opposite of the one that you'd think. It's not that regulators are coming in and saying we insist on the protocol looking like this. The flip is happening. The engineers are looking at the policy requirements, the regulatory requirements, and saying, oh, we have to implement that policy, and aren't translating it into protocol requirements, but thinking that they have to follow the words that are provided by the regulators. So one of the challenges we have is to say, no, we, we need to understand what the policy means, but what does that mean when we translate it into protocol speak? and getting engineers to recognize this distinction has been uh, quite interesting. So in, in each of these cases, what I want to make clear is there is a communication that occurs between the regulators and the engineers, but there's a translation step, um, especially in this latter case, radio engineers are very used to, you look at the regulation, the regulation says you must transmit on this frequency. We tune the device to that frequency. There's a bigger jump when you go from the regulator says there needs to be a database that contains this information and the engineer is quick to say, oh, well, then the, the database must have these fields. Well, might have more, might have less, 
It has to satisfy those requirements. So this has been the interesting interaction. Um, and I think that's all I have. Yes, I think a Andrew uh, does the next bit. So uh, uh, now we're going to turn to this topic of pervasive monitoring, which has been a, a hot topic in the hallways, I guess, and in some of the sessions this week. Um, and so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about what the IETF is doing uh, in, in, in this uh, little area or with respect to, to this issue. And, and the first thing that I think we're, we're in pretty strong agreement about and that we want to be totally clear about is that these kinds of events, all the various stories, you can pick whichever favorite one you want of recent revelations, um, they're all a, a kind of attack. Um, and, and the reason we say they're a kind of attack is because even if you thought, well, they're not really an attack, they're something else, there's no way to tell the difference between these behaviors and an attack, and therefore they have to be treated as though they're attacks. Um, and, and one of the things that's really important about this is that it's a multifaceted kind of uh, attack on the network, um, uh, on the network infrastructure. The behavior here is different from um, some of the previous models that we've used. Now, I think that we need to be clear that from the point of view of many of the technical community who've looked at this, we don't think that this is a unique, um, the, the recent revelations, any of them, are unique. Uh, um, we also don't think that um, uh, this is the end of it, right? I mean, the, the fact that some revelations have come out doesn't mean that people are going to stop doing this. So there are some technical responses that we think we need to, uh, we need to undertake. Um, another thing that we have, uh, I think, concluded, um, and this is a, perhaps a weak conclusion, but I, I think it's shared pretty widely, uh, is, is that there is a really tremendous scale here. Uh, this is a threat model that we didn't really historically consider. So traditionally, um, you know, if you look at a securities consideration doc document, and, and for the few of you who are not familiar with the RFC series, uh, any 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 protocol has to have actually a security consideration section for many years now. And the reason for that, of course, is that there, were, there was an earlier period in which that didn't happen and we ended up with some other kinds of nasty attacks. So um, uh, there's been a, a tradition of certain kinds of security considerations whenever protocols are designed. And typically these, uh, um, these boil down to a few kinds of cases and, and the, the sorts of attacks that we're seeing now are not like that. They're, they're a different kind of attack. The, the scale is enormous. Uh, and, and I think that this was one of the things that we really just didn't consider historically. Now, one of the things we need to admit is that a purely technical response is not going to counter this on its own. There are some other things that would need to happen, some behavioral changes that people are going to have to undertake. Um, there are some conveniences that people are probably going to have to give up um, uh, in order to be secure against some of this stuff. But um, uh, so, so a pure technical response is not going to counter. Nevertheless, there are some things we can do. So next slide, please. Um, oh, before I go on to that, I, I should talk a little bit about where the technical sources are here. So we've got the, the, the straightforward one, which is unprotected communications. And, and this is duh at the end because, um, you know, the, the truth of the matter is if you didn't, you know, if, if two months ago you thought that you didn't need to uh, encrypt your communications most of the time, um, you, you should have been disabused by that by now. Um, uh, and then there are, you know, other sorts of technical uh, uh, attacks. I, I mean, there's the direct access to the peer, to one of the peers in the exchange. So if you can actually get onto the endpoint before any of the communication has started, then you can see the stuff before it happens. Uh, you can have direct access to the keys. There's, there's considerable evidence that there's been attempts uh, or in some cases successful, um, uh, typically subpoenas, that say, give us the keys and now we're going to look at all the traffic. Um, we've got third-party problems, right? This is something that is not totally news. Um, we had, for instance, uh, certificate problems. Their certificate authorities have been undermined. Um, there's been several of those over the last several years. Um, it appears that there are some cases where implementation backdoors uh, have either actually been inserted or anyway are widely believed to have been inserted. Um, I, I, I want to be careful not to make assertions that those things actually exist because, of course, we don't have clear evidence one way or the other, but there, there's some pretty tantalizing evidence. 
Um, and then we've got cases where uh, there have been accusations of standards that are vulnerable or, or maybe have been made to be vulnerable. Uh, and once again, I don't want to assert that that has or has not happened. I, I don't have, you know, I don't have documentary evidence in front of me that this, that this event has happened, but there's certainly some suggestion that that has happened. Uh, and one of the most obvious examples is this elliptic curve um, case uh, where it appears possible that two of the parameters were selected to make the, the, the al algorithm easier to crack. Um, I, I want to temper that by pointing out that the last time somebody thought parameters had been accepted in order to weaken the algorithm, it turned out that those parameters had actually been selected to strengthen the algorithm because of an attack that was classified. So uh, let's not um, be careless about uh, hurling around um, uh, claims. Uh, but there is this uh, there is this suggestion that this has happened. Next, please. So, what is the IETF doing? There are some technical things that the IETF can do, and these are the things that we can do. And one of them is not strictly speaking a technical uh, response; it's to discuss the topic openly. One of the things that is super important, generally speaking, in the security business uh, on, on the network, and traditionally has been true, uh, particularly about cryptography, is is that more open analysis tends to be better. Algorithms that are developed in secret by a secret committee in a back room with like, you know, industry players in the room and nobody else are frequently cracked within, you know, days, weeks, or months of them being released to the public because um, everybody can design a system that they can't break themselves. Um, and the, the problem is that you, what you need is a system that other people can't break, and the only way really to tell whether that system is, is resilient against that kind of stuff is to stand it up and allow those other people to take hits at it. So we want to we wanna have this discussion, and we want to have this discussion in the open. Uh, therefore, we're devoting a significant portion of the Vancouver meeting, uh, which is coming up uh, two weeks hence, right? Um, uh, we're devoting a significant portion of that meeting um, to, to these problems. And that means we're actually working on the problem. It's not enough just to talk about it or to rant, you know, oh, people shouldn't do this. We actually need to tackle the problems that are open. So we've got a birds of a feather session in Vancouver that is there actually to address specific proposals, um, changes, to, uh, changes to particular technologies. Uh, there is, for instance, a discussion of selection of uh, transport layer security algorithms. So when you have TLS, you know, you do HTTPS and you go to a secure website um, that's secured with TLS, and um, there are algorithms that are used for that kind of exchange. One of the things that we um, maybe need to do is deal with those algorithms and decide which of them are the right ones to use because, you know, there's this suggestion about this elliptic curve that is a problem. Also, um, there is this PFS, is a, uh, initials for perfect forward security. Um, the idea of that is, is that even if you recover the key, the, 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 the key right now, you don't have the session key. So perfect forward security prevents this key from being used in the future to, to decrypt the traffic again. Uh, and that is something that is not widely used right now, and it's something that I think we're probably going to try to encourage. Uh, we've also got some ongoing efforts, uh, things that have been around already that were, were in train long before most of these recent revelations came out. Uh, one in particular is that there's been a proposal um, floating around for a little while now that the next version of HTTP, which of course underlies almost everything that we do on the internet anymore, um, would use encryption all the time. So it just wouldn't be, uh, it, it just wouldn't be possible to turn it off. Um, and so these weird problems that you have, well, are you using security or not? The answer is, well, you don't get to choose. Uh, and, and, right, this is an engineering trade-off. This is um, what I was talking about earlier, how we enable or, um, uh, or disable various features because, you know, we've got the protocol. We're not making policy. That's a nice distinction in theory, but in practice there are occasions when, you know, what you do in the, in the um, protocol opens or closes various policy options for you. And here would be an example where we would say, no, the protocol is simply going to require uh, encryption all the time. You don't get to have that choice. And the reason is we think that it makes for a better protocol overall, that the, the, the technical goals of the protocol are better achieved by doing that. So this is a technical discussion, not merely a policy one. Uh, similarly, uh, TLS itself is up for a little bit of revision, so there's a 1.3 version that is, uh, is under discussion. So these are some, some positive, uh, concrete things that the ITF can do in terms of technology. 
Uh, that's the only thing I had to say about this, and I think this concludes all of the preparatory, uh, prepared material we have, so I guess we open the floor. <coughs> Thank you very much. And um, we are now opening the floor to comments, uh, questions. We have a, the first question over there. Hello. Good morning. Thank you so much for for giving us this great update. What ITF is doing. Well, my question is, I think it, it, it is not an easy answer, but I would like to hear some comments from you. My name is Alejandro Costa. I'm from Venezuela, and I'm an ISOC ambassador. Well, on Monday uh, during the LACNOC meeting, we are going to have a ITF tutorial, and what I would like to hear from you is, what would you like? Suppose you're giving the, the training, what would you like to say to the participants in order to encourage them to participate more in ITF? The attendee list is mainly Latin American and Caribbean people. Thank you. I'll take a stab at this. Um, one thing to keep in mind about the ITF is it is very open in a weird way. So all of the mailing lists are open. You can join anyone and start participating immediately. All of the decisions are taken on the mailing list. You can see what decisions are being taken. You don't even have to show up for meetings. That's all well and good. But that does mean that the controls over the discussion are not very strong. So um, a friend once said a long time ago that on the internet you need a thick skin and a civil tongue. Um, the civil tongues are quite lacking in the IETF often. Um, people are not always careful. So for new participants, I try and tell them, come and listen first. Um, especially for Latin America, the language difficulty is, is, is just we're stuck with it. English is the language we use to do the protocol development. We discuss on a regular basis, shouldn't we do translation, shouldn't we figure this out? At least the introductory material, what we call the Tau of the IETF, is translated into many languages just so you can get a feel for how to do this. But I, I, I urge people to come, join mailing lists they're interested in, and then spend time listening and see where you can jump in with a comment every so often um, and know that there will be someone who is ill-socialized and maybe some of us will try and whack them on the nose, who will say, what a stupid idea. This is going to get said. And the, the thing to do is to nod your head, read through the content, see what important information this person has said other than grumbling that you are stupid for some reason, and participate again. Um, it, it, it's a strange culture. Um, that said, we have had people come in from all parts of the world whose, language, whose native language is not English and have done incredibly well by persevering, by sitting, not attacking immediately because uh, we're better at it than most new people are <laughs> and, and attack right back, but by just being persistent and saying, but I think this is important and laying out the technical reasons for any particular proposal and have done phenomenally well. Um, one of my working group chairs now is one of these people who just came right in. Uh, he's from Mauritius. A well, former AD came in as a very young person uh, from Russia and has done incredibly well just by being persistent and um, laying out the arguments. So um, beyond that, reading the Tao, I think, is probably uh, an important first step. It'll get you an idea of what the arguments are about and how to formulate those things. With my Latin American hat on, uh, the Tao has been translated into Spanish uh, already, and it's been, uh, I mean, it's been translated to, into Portuguese, but it's not published yet. Uh, I, I agree with all of that. Um, uh, I would follow up with a couple of other things that I would say. Um, one thing to remember is that, you know, the ITF has a role, and it's not the only role on the internet. So some people um, need to 
you know, sort of witness the IETF in order to see how the sausage is being made. But, but maybe they don't really need to participate there because their area of expertise is not especially technical or they're not really interested in the, in the protocols. Um, there are lots of things that people try to bring to the IETF that just don't belong there, um, right? Everything that happens on the internet doesn't have to happen at the IETF. And sometimes people think, oh, well, they do the standards for the internet over there. I want to control how um, people think on the internet. Therefore, I should uh, write a standard for that. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm being cartoonish, right? But the whole point is that we sometimes get proposals for things that aren't, aren't really relevant. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't understand how the IETF works. And so that's one class of people who, who can benefit from learning something about how the IETF works or who can benefit from seeing it but who don't necessarily need to participate. And then there are people who want to participate in the IETF. Uh, and what I would say to people who want to do that is a key thing you must do is read the drafts. Uh, this is a mistake that a lot of people make. They, they think, oh, well, the meeting is what's the important part. The meeting is the least important part of all of this. The most important part is to read the, the draft, some proposal that somebody has, you find something that they want to talk about that is a topic of interest to you, and you say, hey, I know something about that thing. You read through the, the draft that somebody is proposing. Here is how I propose that we're going to make this protocol work. And you look at it and you say, oh, well, that's a good idea. I think this works. Or I didn't understand this part. If you're, a, if you're a, uh, an internet draft author, nothing is so valuable to you as hearing from somebody, I didn't understand what you meant here. Because when you're, when you're trying to write a protocol, what you want to do is make sure that any random person off in the future can read that thing and know, oh, I know exactly what this was supposed to be telling me. So, so reading those drafts and then sending the feedback. And if you're too intimidated to send the feedback on a mailing list, the author's email address, their own email address, is in the internet draft. So send the feedback directly to them. They will incorporate it, or maybe they won't. I mean, some of them are you know, sort of big-headed jerks. But, um, uh, but but most of them are genuine. Most people are there to get work done, not to aggrandize themselves. And so they want to get that work done, and they value the feedback. Um, another nice thing about this, of course, is if you give that feedback and it's useful to people, then someday in the future when you publish an internet draft and you want to get some uh, review, you can you know tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you're not an idiot. Would you please review this for me? And they will remember, oh, that person did me a favor in the past. I better do the same back. So there's, there's genuinely a sort of community building exercise here that has to do with scratching one another's back because everybody knows, you know, if you've, if you've ever worked on any kind of code or any kind of document you've written or anything like that, it's always better from a good review from somebody else who looks at it with fresh eyes and says, you know, this passage is completely unclear or this idea is just totally bonkers. You shouldn't do it that way. Here's a simple way to do it. So that's a really valuable feature that you can get into the IETF very easily. Um, and it need not be uh, a language barrier in that case, because even uh, even something that is is not perfectly grammatical or something like that, it's still nevertheless a very very helpful contribution. The, the fireworks at a meeting are less important. Thank you. I'm Nabil Ben Amar from Morocco. I'm here uh, as an ISOC ambassador. I have uh, recently joined some working groups in ITF. I'm I'm a little bit new in this uh, area, and I was. I was not able to jump in and to, to, to make some comments. It was so quick and uh, I'm just new, newbie in the, in the, in the, in the, the area. Until so that day when uh, I'm, I'm following the work of a non-working group, which is I, ITS, Intelligent Transport System, with Alexandro Petrescu. And I asked him, I, 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 I sent an email, please, I would like to be more effective in, the, in, in this uh, group. Uh, what can you propose? Automatically, he sent me uh, a proposition. Can you write for us a section in the current draft? Oh, I say yes. Why not? And I, I started to, to write uh, a, a section, and now uh, my name is in the, the submitted draft to the ITF. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and it was the, the first time that I uh, come in this uh, thing and uh, uh, following this work our book is accepted in Vancouver and uh, I will uh, uh, apply for uh, a fellowship to for the next one which is in London. So uh, this is excellent and I, I want to say that your experience here um, 
is similar to an experience of old experienced people. Um, very often, especially the experienced people who think that their opinions are, of course, obvious and, and should be taken as, as the word of you know, a deity, um, will say, this section is rubbish and needs to change because you don't explain how the protocol will do X, Y, and Z. Okay. The first response that any author of an IETF draft sends to one of these people is send text. You think there's a problem, fix it. Send me a paragraph to replace it with. Send me a new section. And so this is a, a, our, our weapon against people who make random comments. So you did exactly the right thing by asking in, in the nice way, and you got luckily a nice person to say, yes, this is exactly what you need to do, is send text. And so if you want to start participating, I think this is a great way to do so, is go through, look at a document that's currently under development, and say, I know about this piece of, how to program this piece of protocol, and this isn't going to work, we should reverse it, or we should make this clearer. Send a suggested replacement paragraph. That's what works, much better than just saying, I have reviewed this and I think there's a problem here. Fix the problem. Yeah, just um, the Internet Society runs a fellowship program to the IETF meeting, and that was our friend from Morocco was referring. And the uh, application period is open now, and it's open until November 15th. So it's just a piece of our advertisement. Sorry. Thank you. Along those lines, so the fellowship gets you to the meeting. But one of the new programs that we have at the IETF, which has been set up by a few people, is a mentorship program so that we can basically buddy you up with an experienced person to help you through at least the meeting um, and you know, show you how to participate reasonably and you, someone to ask questions of. So uh, I think these two go hand in glove quite nicely. Got it, yep, yep, got it. Um, so uh, I have uh, so Pinda Wong from Hong Kong, and uh, I'm a uh, subscriber to the Profess mailing group. I also participate in the WTC web payments group. Um, so what I would like to do is uh, take up on one of your points about separation of protocols and policy. So I have a question and a contribution. So the question is, um, is you say the ITF just does protocol, and no, someone else does policy. So way back when, um, we, we did that once. We have one one good example that I'm familiar with, which was um, when the IIB, way back when, pointed me to look at this uh, uh, GTLD MOU stuff, this was before ICANN, then that sucked away 10 years of my life um, because uh, I became... The only 10. Only 10, <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit more than... That was a good one. Um, so what happened was uh, I, I was the first vice chairman of ICANN, and we, we've seen what happened there. And so with respect to what I observe right now in the current context is that there seems to be an even need within that community to look at policy, policy of what. And so ICANN should, you know, just those names, numbers, right? We've got all these other really important issues that have policy elements that are, as you've heard in the last week, also occur. So I would love to have a question, which is, do you have any idea about what other kinds of policy fora perhaps it's the, I, uh, the IGF, I don't know, that really could uh, interact, or, or what would be the requirements from the ITF perspective of a type of policy body that you would be um, prepared to engage in? And the reason why I ask that is because I've got a selfish agenda, which is I'm also part of this uh, strategy panel, uh, the strategy panel on ICANN's role in the internet governance ecosystem. Let me just start with a question. Um, so th that I can't say what the IETF would be prepared to participate in. Um, I, I wouldn't even venture to guess. But um, uh, but I can say what I am prepared to uh, participate in. And it seems to me that this is partly related to um, it, it's partly a case by case answer. So there are things that are that need a, a consistent global policy like the DNF 
Well, why does it need this consistent global policy? Because it's got this foundational piece that is that everybody has to share, whether you like it or not. Um, so you don't have any choice there. You actually need a global coordination because there's one DNS route that's just a fact of math, and therefore you need um, uh, you need some sort of coordination. There are other kinds of cases which uh, for which we need you know sort of best practices um, uh, or or best um, uh, you know you know the sort of kinds of uh, of interactions that we need to have an ability to say. In this case, here is the kind of thing that you probably want to do. Uh, a good example of that, to, to push it in the other direction, is um, the security practices for sort of end-to-end -end communication for, say, e-commerce. So you know, you've got what is very valuable data that you're exchanging there, and you want this very valuable data to be treated, to be handled well all the way along the, the, the system. And actually, that's an example of something that, with a few uh, with a few wrinkles, has um, despite the fact that there have been a number of compromises, we actually understand how that's supposed to work, right? You should have strong authentication in both directions. You should have um, good handling of the sensitive data at either end so you don't end up storing data that is easily compromised. Um, and, and what's interesting there is that we didn't really need a global coordinating body um, that was a single body. Instead, it was a group of people who got together and said, you know, we are the, we are the credit card um, people, for instance, whose, whose losses are going to be directly affected by this kind of stuff. Uh, so you will store this data in this way, or we will yank your credit card, um, uh, your ability to, to handle credit cards. Um, what we didn't do well uh, was, uh, was make the security of the browser uh, really strong. That is, the client-side stuff, we sort, of, we sort of ditched, right? And we ended up with a user interface that is just awful. Um, uh, and, and we've tried three or four different attempts to make that better, uh, and that hasn't worked yet. So, so there's a lot of work to do uh, around usable security um, uh, for, for end users, uh, and I don't know where that work ought to live. It probably shouldn't live in the ITF because we're not very good at user interface, but, but somewhere good, strong user interface um, uh, conventions probably ought to come about. That's an example of something that I would like to see you know, various industry people come together and try to figure out how to do that. There are, there's some, there's a, a group, traditionally there's the human computer interaction stuff, you know, ACM has some things around this and so on. It would be nice if those academic studies um, influenced some kind of group that came together for usable security stuff. And that's maybe something that, you know, uh, OS vendors and browser developers and, um, you know, a few other kinds of things, probably, um, uh, probably mobile OS, uh, people could do a lot of a lot of good there because if you think the security practices are bad on the desktop browser, you know, look at the way security is handled on phones, and it's just a total train wreck. You never know what you're going to get. So there's a, a whole host of stuff there that I think that's that's the kind of example of something that I would expect is going to be most effectively uh, contributed to by a true multi-stakeholder kind of thing in which governments could participate by saying hey, here's some good practices or here are regulations that we're going to, uh, we're going to put on uh, in order to do consumer protection, but that doesn't mean we're going to tell you how to do it. Um, the um, developers can say, well, here is, we've, we've got all this instrumentation in our systems and we can see what's effective and what isn't, and therefore we can tell, um, you know, this is, uh, this is working. The credit card people, for instance, are going to be able to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're, storing, you're storing visa numbers in the clear on the system, don't do that. I mean, those are all kinds of examples of you know a group of people, all of whom have particular expertise, and they should come together and do that. And that's a kind of activity that I think should be self-organizing. Uh, and then there are other kinds of things that I think, um, to, to finish, um, uh, there are other kinds of things that I think actually probably ought to be dealt kind of at a, uh, you know, literally at the level of national laws or something like that. So there are, for instance, practices of, um, uh, of carriers uh, historically, those have all been handled at the at the national level, and it's going to be very difficult to um, to change that behavior. And I would like to think that um, that those federal authorities and uh, the, you know those national governments are going to be influenced by their population to say, "Hey, wait a minute, uh, we don't want you interfering in this operation, or we don't want you tapping things this way, or anyway, we don't want you tapping things in secret this way. Um, you know, we want these things to be open or whatever." But that, to me, is something that you know if if national governments are actors in that case, and therefore, 
it's really national governments who have to be taking the pressure from their populations to be saying, hey, here's the kind of thing that we're going to do. Maybe that's something that actually does have to happen in intergovernmental, multilateral, et cetera, uh, sorts of environments. Uh, I, I don't know. I am but a geek. I don't really understand how politics work. But, um, but I would say that it seems to me that these are, you know, these are different sorts of contexts and they need a different kind of answer. <laughs> yeah, perhaps I should also, then we'll, um, and I've been, I, I'm, I'm one of the techies that has worked in the IETF, but also in policy context, and it sounds, and I've been listening to a lot of discussions, and occasionally stepping into discussions about what's the role of the technical community in a forum like this, or the policy forum. And one of the things I think I'm, I'm closing in on is that it's inherent, particularly in a lot of what you said. Um, there's a fundamentally different set of approaches. Policy people will ask, who are you as a stakeholder? Engineers will ask, what's the problem? And an enormous amount of what I think I see of people talking past each other comes down to, and this isn't even characteristic of the, the individuals, it's characteristic of the framework that they're coming into the discussion with, because I know plenty of people who can move back and forth between these frameworks, but if you're sitting in one frame of reference, and saying, what's the problem? And what you're hearing is, who are you? It, people end up talking about each other. And even just being aware of that and being able to say that at the right time is actually really helpful in a lot of rooms, whether you're oriented on policy or technology. I, I was uh, on a panel earlier in the week, um, and they were talking about pervasive monitoring. And uh, the participant who posed the question said, one of the things we really have to look at is who is the enemy we're talking about? Is it the government doing the monitoring or is it Google doing the monitoring or is it uh, criminals who are... And, and I said, you know, two things about the technical community. First of all, you'll notice that on, on this issue, the technical community has really not panicked at all. They just kind of nod their heads and say, oh, we have a tool to fix that and oh, we should work on a tool to fix this. But I said, the other thing is, we don't think about it in terms of who is the attacker. We think about it in terms of what is the attack? What are you trying to prevent? And in many of these cases, no matter which the attacker is, it's exactly the same attack, as Andrew was pointing to earlier. And getting your head around the technical problem as not being about the people involved, but the computers and the systems and the networks involved is a very good way to sort of turn the question so that it doesn't turn into this uh, roiling discussion. Um, it's a different way of approaching the problem. Thank you very much. Hello, Jane Coffin from the Internet Society. I just wanted to make a pitch for um, one of the programs that we're running, which is the Policy Fellows to the IETF. We have a colleague named Sally um, Wentworth who works closely with Sebastian and others to find people from government that might want to know more about the IETF. It really helps with the, the issue that Suzanne was highlighting, the difference between what policymakers and technologists and how they think. And often we have policymakers who want to get into how to regulate technology, which is a little scary. And when you bring some of the policymakers to the IETF, they come in their personal capacity, and we've seen an amazing turnaround in the ability for many people to understand what the IETF is, because they, they're hearing about it perhaps at the ITU, and they're not sure what it is. And once they go, they realize it's a really great open forum. They have the ability to talk to key technologists on routing, addressing, other issues of interest to them throughout the world, and it's a, it's a careful forum where you're not, um, no one's going to, it's almost like Chatham House rules. No one's going to tell someone you ask this question. So it's a very comfortable environment, and it's something where you're breaking down the barriers between technology and policy and trying to marry that up. So if anybody is interested in that type of thing or knows government officials that want to go, we help provide assistance to do that. We have a nice team coming from Latin America. So the Vancouver meeting is, uh, I think, seven people from, I mean, seven policy makers uh, for this program. Uh, if I recall correctly, people from uh, Uruguay, Brazil, uh, uh, Peru, 
uh, uh, Nicaragua, uh, San Martin, a small island in the Caribbean, and some other countries. So it's going to be it's going to be fun. And and they can sit in a room and hum with everybody else. It's quite amusing. Something that is very amazing about this uh, po uh, policy makers program is that, um, at least in Latin America, uh, we set up a mailing list for all uh, our our alumni that went to the IETF. I mean, policy makers that went to I the IETF meeting and are back. And suddenly, um, there were discussions, and there are very good discussions on that list. It's a policy maker. I mean, it's a policy guy. I mean, it's not a technical guy. It's not a real. I mean, maybe it's an engineer, but it's not. In, in that area and working in that field and uh, it was like two or three months ago there was a discussion I, I don't know about what topic but they were no because RFC 2156 says that no no I beg your pardon but that's been deprecated by yeah RFC whatever blah, 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 blah. so they were kind of experts in our RFC lingo <laughs> at, at that point so, so that is amazing so do we have more questions Comments? No. Contribution? Oh, yeah, okay. If you consider so, I mean, it is. I mean, it's hard for me to say. I, I'm not going to be able to go uh, to Vancouver. Um, but I'm on the list, and I don't feel it's. Uh, um, there will be people there who are more knowledgeable than me. That's fine. Um, so, what I wanted to to, to um, perhaps explore is, you know, although these revelations are not so much revelations. Uh, one thing that I think is, is uh, I think apparent to me is that the users now have uh, uh, are recalibrating their expectation of what they want. And so as we look into the future, one of the problems of looking into the future in terms of a projection model is because that projection model is always based on the current reality. And so one of the techniques I, I use in terms of um, looking at um, um, technology, uh, how technology could evolve is to do it from the other way around, which is have a look at sort of the end, the end in mind. What, what, what we really want, and then to backcast it back and say, well, look, in fact, what we need is this. What we need is this. What we need is this kind of thing, and then fill in the specific plate. So, uh, I just want to just float the idea that instead of just looking at today's reality and today's the urgency and all the crisis that we have to deal today, is to also have a bit of a uh, sort of. Uh, a vision, again, I think we stated the vision in terms of open standards, open internet, but I'm not sure if that translates to users because they don't really care how we got here. <laughs> they care about, you know, what what are my sort of, uh, what's the feature set coming forward? And so what I would suggest is, again, looking at, if you look at the um, environmental community where they have deep concerns about, the, you know, we all have deep concerns about how the environment is going to pan out. And so if you based it from, you know, we don't want a global warming to have devastating effect as an assumption, or the energy community, right, you know, peak oil or what have, have you, as a known constraint and backcast it to where we are today, maybe that may, may help um, frame and help communicate the ITF discussions with the rest of the world. And it's that intersection between what you're doing in terms of going forward and what users could be expected back where that intersection may be an uh, interesting place to explore. And so what I would, um, I'll speak to you guys offline about this, but that's the concept. I think you're right about this, and I, and I think that this is part of the reason why, uh, in, in what I touched on earlier, the point was that this is a kind of attack that historically we hadn't really paid attention to. That is, we had a model for what the environment was going to be like, and it involved endpoints and secure communications between them. And there were a lot of concern about on-path attacks. And there were, you know, this sort of man in the middle kind of thing. And there was a lot of concern about replay. Um, that is, you know, you, you um, suck that thing up and then you play it back later and you have some kind of thing. But there was not a, a lot of concern. Uh, uh, and, and I should say also there was this concern about sort of individual points of attack, right? So you've got, um, you know, can somebody brute force this key really easily and so on. And so there's just this sort of straightforward consideration, okay, um, you know, what is the strength of this thing? What is the expected lifetime of that key? What is the, or, or signature or whatever you've got? And what is the, what is the expected vulnerability period? And then what you want to do is make sure that the 
the vulnerability period is always shorter than the, the length of time that somebody you know, could possibly attack this thing. So those are the kinds of attacks that we're talking about. Uh, what we did not think about is the kind of environment in which, in which there's just this kind of hyper-pervasive uh, thing where somebody's got this net and they're, it's a sort of sieve net for the internet, right? They're sucking up everything and they're just kind of running over that. And so what I think we missed in our modeling uh, was uh, a sort of environment where, uh, where the total pervasiveness of this was, uh, was a problem. And that, and, and that is, of course, a failure of vision, fundamentally, of the sort that you're talking about. That is, we, we, we didn't think about one kind of way to do this. Or I, I think more accurately, if you go and read archives from, from the periods where some of these discussions happen, what you'll discover is that people said, well, yeah, that's a theoretical possibility, but who's going to be able to do that? Um, and it turns out that, you know, there are people who are not only going to be able to, but also willing to do that, and therefore you had a problem. Um, uh, so I think that that is the kind of thing that you're exactly right. What you need to have is a sort of vision. Well, what else is a serious kind of thing? Um, and this is not the only time where the IETF made this kind of mistake. Another example, for instance, was in, it was in the DNS, is an area that I'm pretty familiar with. So, so the so-called Kaminsky attacks that were a big deal, if you look at the history of this, actually, more than 10 years before Kaminsky had his roadshow, um, Dan Bernstein in particular was saying, hey, there's a big attack here and it's totally available. And people in the DNS community sort of said, well, yeah, but come on, it's a theoretical attack, it's not really going to happen. Uh, and then it turned out that it could happen in like, you know, three packets. Um, and, so, and so it turned out that it was quite a lot, hard, uh, quite a lot easier than anybody thought. Nobody had done the analysis, and it was a bad day. So, um, so it's that kind of thing where, where, you know, this is a place where um, the open, uh, open environment can lead to um, those sorts of bad decisions. Of course, the, the nice thing about an open standards environment is that when you make that kind of mistake, everybody can just kind of go, you know, in public and, um, and, and try to fix it, rather than what we've sometimes seen with closed um, standards environments where the answer is no, we don't believe that that's an attack and by the way, we're going to make it illegal for you to have those keys anyway. Um, so, so, you know, there's a fundamental difference in the approach here that at least the resilience or the, or the response um, in this kind of open environment is a, little bit, is a little bit better, but I would prefer it if we had uh, failures that were a little less hard than what we've just had. So that's an example of something that I think we probably can do quite a lot better. One little follow-up on that. I, I, I don't know that in particular this was a failure to get into a future space of thinking about what could be there and working backwards. I think it was, in, in this particular case, people did go to that future space and said, yeah, but why, why do we need to protect against that set of things? So I as far back as I can remember, there were discussions of the engineering trade-offs of doing opportunistic encryption. That is, you encrypt with some key, whatever it is, and the whole issue of verifying who's on the other end is a separate thing. The security community pretty early on said, well, we could do that, but the real attacks, what we're really worried about is someone being in the middle, and so the first thing you have to do is make sure you're talking to who you think you're talking to, and then and only then do you start doing encryption. Well, what would have solved this problem very effectively would be for all of us to have been encrypting all along and do the verification steps later. Um, all software just encrypts, and to make sure that you're talking to who you think you're talking to, that's a separate matter and, and make it a, a different part of the policy. So I don't know that we didn't do that future thinking. I, I think the hard part is envisioning what's going to be important to users. I, I think you frame that exactly right. And um, that's a hard headspace to get into. Um, we're very good at designing for users who are just like us. Um, there turn out to be exceedingly few of those folks. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments, runs? So we'd like to thank you guys if uh, there is no further comments or questions. And um, thank you all for attending.
and, and many thanks to our moderator as well. Thank you very much.